In essence, the Cold War arose from an ever-increasing conflict among Western democracy and the threat of Soviet Russia's communist ideals. The conflict became the most heated after World War II when there was a dispute between the Soviet Union and the rest of the Allied superpowers on how to govern occupied Germany. The disputing powers were supposed to rule Germany jointly, but the Soviets supported communism, and the democratic West Berlin became threatened by the communist East Berlin. This division later became a symbol for the entire Iron Curtain. As a whole, the curtain became a major separation dividing East Europe and West Europe for the next five decades. During this time, the United States defended democracy by formulating policies that would prevent the Soviet Union from exporting the red flag to other countries. The augmenting tension between Communist Russia and the Democratic U.S. led to one of the greatest arms races that lasted until the fall of Communist Russia in 1991, 46 years after the end of World War II. Both countries began to develop new technologies including nuclear weapons as well as radar and missile defense systems. Due to the growing threat of a communist regime, America shifted its attention from home goods to wartime supplies to help the war effort, similar to the industrial shift during World War I and World War II. After the crisis of 1949, in which the Soviet occupation shut off all power and supplies to West Berlin, the U.S. had to step in and aid West Berlin for the next year. By this time, cold relations among the superpowers of the world had already been implemented, and the military-industrial complex was undoubtedly on its way. Defined as the relationship between the government and the company to manufacture weapons for the military, this concept was enunciated by Eisenhower in his farewell address in 1961. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Now that the government was establishing a symbiotic relationship with the arms companies in the private sector, many businesses and other companies saw this as an opportunity to negotiate huge contracts with the government in return for new weapons and systems of defense. One of these large companies was Raytheon. This company focused primarily on radar and missile development. Eisenhower stated that there were over 3 million people involved in the military-industrial complex and Raytheon employed a little under 2,000 people. Bill Ladulis was one of the 3 million Americans involved in the military-industrial complex and one of 2,000 who worked for the Raytheon company in Wayland, Massachusetts. Bill worked at Raytheon for nearly all of the Cold War from 1957 to 1991. He worked with Raytheon in attaining contracts from the military to produce new technologies such as radar and radar display systems. During his years of service, Bill often felt an underlying resolve to one-up the Russians' radar technology, but he felt more competition from similar companies who were also striving to receive large contracts from the government to produce new technologies. Did you work on any like classified projects or that like contained protected information? Or? Well, yes, uh, most of the design of the Power Tools was classified uh, because of the, within the country, of course, competition, but also within the world uh, activity of uh, having the enemies of, of our country being able to get a hold of our design. When asked about if he had ever come into contact with Russian equipment, Mr. Ladulis responded, In the process 
of analyzing tubes and things, I had an occasion to test a tube that came to me from some source that I learned later uh, was a Russian radar tube. And in our, our analysis of the metallurgy found that the, the copper structure in their radar tube was not OFHC copper. So you, basically you had a, a leg up on what they had? Yeah, the quality of our power tubes was far beyond theirs. Mr. Ledoulis was also deeply involved with the design and development of a variety of electronic systems for the Defense Department and civilian and military air traffic control. After four years of working on radar power tubes and fire control radar systems, he was transferred to the Wayland Radar Systems Lab in 1957. At the Wayland plant, many systems were being designed and developed using power tube technologies. Mr. Ledoulis told us that he always felt a sense of pride in his work. He explained that seeing one's vision go from the drawing board to finished product was an exciting and rewarding process. This example here is one of nine radar displays that Mr. Ledoulis was in charge of designing. They were built for the NASA Apollo program in 1965 and required that three of the units be shipboard and the other six be land-based and spread out all around the world. On one day in November of 1957, Bill witnessed the Russian Sputnik flying overhead. Sputnik was the first satellite to be successfully launched into space by the Russians. This was a big wake-up call for Bill and the rest of America because the Russians now had an upper hand and could possibly monitor their every move. Subsequently, this resulted in an emphasis to develop improved missile defense systems like the Hawk, the Patriot, the NATO Sea Sparrow, and the Aegis shipboard Tartar systems. Radar systems that Bill worked on in the late 1970s included the Cobra Dane in Shamya, Alaska, Power Paws on Cape Cod, and a system called Cobra Judy on a naval ship called Observation Island. These were specifically Cold War radar stations. They were built to detect any hostile intercontinental ballistic missiles that threatened the U.S. as well as other countries. He worked on the design of many segments of these systems and managed sections and programs. The evolution of these programs led to the international cooperative efforts of missile defense. In this particular photograph, Bill is standing in the observation tower of a ship off the coast of Cape Canaveral and monitoring the effects of a large blast on the radar systems within the ship. From the time he began working at Raytheon until his retirement in 1992, Bill had experienced nearly the entire scope of the Cold War. In 1991, several independent commonwealths threatened to secede from the USSR, and the USSR was officially dissolved on Christmas of 1991, only two years after the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Over the past 40 plus years, Bill had worked on countless projects at Raytheon in support of the defense sector as well as America's overall defense. 